Hello and welcome, everyone. Um, thank you very much for, for giving up uh, an hour of your time this morning. My name's Jamie, uh, and I'm the Business Development Director here at Tribal Worldwide. And I help sort of lead the ideation and, and creation of any of the sort of strategies or propositions uh, for any new clients considering to partner with us. Uh, for those of you who don't know who Tribal Worldwide is, uh, we are a total experience agency. Um, and what we mean by that is, is we think beyond established customer experiences and work with brands to really innovate uh, in their customer journeys, whether that be from online to offline, out of home and in store, as, as well as the internal engagement processes and procedures um, that aim to create ecosystems that build better products, services, communications, and ultimately better businesses. So these events are designed to bring together industry leaders from a diverse range of sectors and companies to provide new points of view and learn from each other on how we can deliver new, better and more total experiences that better serve your customers um, and deliver more value. So our latest event in the, in the city, our latest event series, sorry, is called Stronger Than Before, where uh, we've been speaking with brands and companies that have, have really endured <laughs> this year. I think endured is probably the best to, uh, word to use, um, but have really kind of emerged um, stronger than really before uh, this pandemic. Um, and uh, we've been talking to, to brands and we'll be talking to brands today around uh, how they've really pivoted and, and innovated and launched new products and services to meet the changing needs of their audience. This is actually the seventh event in this new series and the last of the year, which is rather emotional for me. But uh, uh, today we're going to be d diving into the future of fundraising and the diversification required by charities to continue raising the critical funds needed to support their causes against a backdrop of tough economic, political and global health crises. We're going to be hearing from a charity that's really succeeded this year, as well as one of Tribal's most senior account directors who has led a research project with Great Ormond Street Hospital and is really keen to share some of those findings uh, of this research with, with the wider charity community. Uh, and this research is literally hot off the press, having been presented back to the client yesterday. Um, as always, we, we like these sessions to be really interactive. So, so please submit any questions in the chat box or the Q&A box or, or just directly to me if, you, if you'd like to remain sort of anonymous. Um, and I'll look to get them answered as we go through. So please kind of send, send any and all questions you might have um, uh, as, as we move through. So joining us today, first of all, is, is Anna Jones, Fundraising Director at Calm. Uh, Anna has worked for the third sector for the vast majority of her career, um, with her current role being fundraising director at the Campaign Against Living Miserably. Uh, Anna's fundraising background has predominantly been in, in public fundraising with a sprinkling of, of, of statutory, but her time at Calm has expanded um, her experience into philanthropy and, and corporate fundraising. Uh, when Anna started at, at Calm, she had a team of two and an, an, an annual income of about 1.2 million. And this has grown to a team of 10 and a revenue of around uh, just over five and a half million in just four years. Um, and and our skill, skills are very much around leadership, growth and change management, charity law and practice, people management. So um, we're really keen to, to, to hear a lot from Anna today. And as I've mentioned, joining uh, Anna is Melissa McDonald, uh, Senior Account Director here at Tribal Worldwide, um, leading the project with Great Ormond Street Hospital, but also working across um, a consumer brands such as Sayat and, and Cupra, but with over 20 years under Melissa's belt, has worked sort of both client and agency side, working um, on innovative marketing digital strategies for brands, uh, among others, including Dyson, Porsche, Mercedes, Beats by Dre. So I think a lot of those kind of consumer brand lessons that certainly can be brought into the charity sector, I think, I think it's going to be really interesting point of view today so, so welcome melissa welcome anna um hope you're you're both well um so <clears throat> the topic of of the future of fundraising and diversification of fundraising is is obviously quite a large topic to to cover off in just under an hour but uh let's definitely give it our first stab i think I think Anna, it would be, be really great to, to come to you first. Um, just give us a li little bit more of a background as to, I suppose, what, what, you, uh, what you were planning uh, back, back in Q1 this year and, and sort of then all of a sudden March coming, March, April coming about and, and how that sort of threw everything out the window and what's really kind of been your experience, um, you know, over the course of this year. 
Hello. Hi to everyone. Uh, I'm first just going to offer a quick apology if you hear any drilling noises in the background. Unfortunately, uh, my neighbours are having some, some work done and it's inescapable in this house. Um, thanks for the intro. That was nice to hear. Um, so I think the, the biggest change to my brilliantly laid out three year strategy was definitely the, uh, the impact of lockdown um, right at the beginning. And for Calm in particular, that impact was felt most keenly in challenge events because prior to this year, challenge events accounted for about a third of our income. Um, running alone counted for 20% for of that income, so a fifth of, of our income. So knowing that the entire challenge event calendar was likely to be wiped out for some months was could have been absolutely catastrophic. Um, and I, I imagine for a lot of charities, it very much nearly was. Um, so that we had to really turn absolutely on a pin with a, with a lot of our strategy and employ tactics differently than we would have employed before um, and focus our efforts on very different areas. Uh, for us, the, the key things that we, we did um, at, very, at the very beginning of this period was, one, we actually asked for money. Um, we've never asked individual um, individuals to donate directly to us before it's never been a part of our strategy for for various reasons but the, the key one being around the nature of what calm does and so we are, we're a suicide prevention charity and a lot of the people who support us have been bereaved by suicide so the real delicacy there about which i imagine is, is similar to anyone who works in hospices um for example um, or anywhere else where death is very much um, the subject, there's real delicacy around asking for money um, directly from people who who may have lost someone. Um, but we actually we did. Um, we tried to very um, a very gentle way in a way that was very um, accessible for our brand. Uh, but we did actually ask and we saw some initial um, really good support from from our, our supporters at that point. And then the second um, sort of key tactic was really drilling into our corporate partners. So going and asking them for money as well. Um, and I think we were, were privileged because of the way that we'd worked with our partners previously. Again, it would never been like a cap in hand relationship. There was always a value exchange with those partners. A lot of the time access to our brand um, was part of that. So it was very much going, going to them and saying, we actually do need money this time. Um, we can promise to do this, that and the other with you in future. But, but right now, we need 100k to keep the helpline going, for example. No, I was a bit muted there. Um, so no, that's really interesting. So it's obviously very, very rapidly having to, to, to change that. How how did you sort of ensure that, uh, how did you kind of really embed that as a team? Obviously, I'm assuming you guys had to sort of very rapidly move to remote working. So obviously you were also dealing with different processes and, and ways of working at the same time. How, how did you sort of manage to to spin up that quickly and, and, and manage to react that quickly? What would you put that down to? I think a really key thing was was the leadership. So our CEO and CEO um, came together to look at actually what would our strategy um, immediately and laid out a very clear eight point strategy for the organisation. So once we had that laid out, it was much easier to understand what our parameters were that we needed to work within and how we needed to, to innovate and what we were doing. Um, I, it was an element of, of taking leadership rather than going to the team um, asking them for ideas because the, the situation being what it was, there was a lot of unrest and panic, and particularly with furlough announcements and some of the team um, were also asked to go on furlough asking them for ideas and for how we were going to get out of this at that time um i think would have been irresponsible as as a as a manager and as a as a director um so that it, i became a lot more directive if you like than i normally would be for those first few months of like this is what i want you to do this is how i want you to approach it mm. um and the absolute dedication of the team like the, the first week they ran themselves completely ragged to the extent that the next week I had to go right so we need to move it down a few gears because you can't sustain this um so really emphasizing to them that it was a marathon not a sprint um and that they needed to just just take it a little bit easy um and then one thing which really revolutionized how we work at calm which we will be taking for um regardless of the landscape in the future is a concept which we've uh, called super groups so it plays on the the idea in the sort of 70s 80s and 90s where various band members um, of different indie rock etc bands would get together and form a super group <laughs> um, so the idea being rather than working in much more silo departmental ways which we had done previously with sort of three or four key departments it was about bringing together a particular piece of work or a particular stream of work across the organization 
or it, trying to enhance collaboration. So one of the key ones there was um, a group between the communications team and the fundraising team to really align on, on what we were doing and to get buy-in from each other really early on in ideas. Whereas previously, you'd work something through for a few months and then take it to the comms team. And rightly so, they would be, well, we should have been put it at this stage. We can't work with the parameters you've given us. You've not thought about this, that and the other and, and vice versa. So a lot of cross team working has really come through. Um, and whilst I you know, wouldn't want to have had the pandemic in an ideal world, um, I think there's some incredible gains that we've actually been able to make um, as to our ways of working. Mm. We're also very lucky that we were set up on G Suite, um, which made working from home really easy. Mm. Mm. Very interesting. I'm definitely going to come back to some of that and, and dig into some of those areas you mentioned in a bit more detail shortly. But but Mel, um, from you as well, I guess just a, just a bit of background as well. Um, I suppose from two perspectives, really. For, firstly, from from obviously the research you've been doing currently with Great Ormond Street Hospital and and kind of what that process was like and and where that's cut where that kind of came from. But but also, I think more broadly speaking kind of what the focus has been um, for your clients over over the course of the year, how you've kind of helped um, steer your clients through through this through this these challenging times. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Uh, pleasure to be here. It's yeah, it's it's something that nobody could have predicted, really. It's just not, nothing that anybody uh, could have foreseen. And I think, um, as Anna says, I think it's been surprising the the winds that have come out of there. Um, specifically interesting for for one of our clients. I've never actually physically met them. They um, they started in uh, April, um, but we've got a you know a really brilliant uh, virtual relationship, if you like, that we built up as a as a team. So I think there's there's been some really unexpected wins in terms of real uh, camaraderie and really working together um, and going over and above to make things happen. Um, but also, I think it's been interesting to see um, kind of from a, I guess, more broader from a kind of work life balance, um, more people being able to kind of balance uh, needs at home, obviously trying to fit meetings around children or other activities that people might have. So I think there's been a real um, openness and acceptance from clients um, and um, from companies to accept that and work around that to, to get the best for their people. So I think that's been been really interesting to see. Um, and certainly from uh, Great Ormond Street um, uh, point of view, um, you know, as with Anna, they've seen a lot of changes and challenges that um, COVID has brought and they've had to really reassess and look at, you know, how they can adapt as a charity to deal with that and and really look um, at the opportunities that they can grasp going forward to, like you say, Anna, to really sustain that funding. That's the most important thing for any charity is just to keep that money coming in. Yeah, no, really interesting, Mel. And, and do you just give us a bit of a flavour, without giving too much away of the secret <laughs> source, I suppose. Um, give us a bit of a flavour as to, obviously, fresh off the press, presented back to the client yesterday. What were the kind of key headlines for you um, uh, that, that kind of came out of that research um, that I think could be really interesting to, to everyone on the call today? Sure, no problem. Um, first, I guess it's really important just to um, for, to contextualise it. So what we looked at for Great Ormond Street was specifically open banking. So that's one of the ways um, that you can look as a you know, technology to look to um, di diversify fundraising. So just in a really kind of simple, functional, technical point of view, open banking is connecting personal financial data with third party apps. Um, but from our point of view, the real value proposition around it and the big takeaway for everybody to, to look at this is this a shift to customer centric banking. And it really genuinely puts the, the customer at the heart of it. So that's a really important um, uh, kind of overview of what, what open banking does. Um, from our side, the, the piece of research that we've embarked um, has been really keen uh, from a gosh point of view to look at the opportunities so fundamentally, we split the research into three core areas. Like I say, we can't we can't give away too much. Um, but you know, as a top top line point of view, our research was split into three areas. So we had um, a reality check, basically, what's open banking the ecosystem, what's its application to the third sector at the moment, um, and we also looked at audiences. So identifying three relevant audiences who can benefit from the technology. And then also, um, really interestingly, we did a simple model of charity motivations and behavioural triggers and looking at uh, what can really enhance success on top of that. 
to, from a top line po- point of view, open banking is, you know, that's seen a lot of press. It's been quite hyped um, and it's set to revolutionize UK banking sector. But what we've realized, it hasn't quite materialized to date. So there's a lot of foundation work still being set up. Um, there's infrastructures being put in place by some of the big banks and there's huge ongoing investment. But what we're getting to is close to a tipping point, but we're just not quite there yet. And I think COVID has um, definitely accelerated some of the false behaviours because we've all had to look at doing more transactions online. So we'd have we've have to, to have trust in doing things remotely and sharing our personal finance financial details. So that's definitely increased and something that's definitely accelerated a, a core element um, of adoption. And once these payment systems have been sorted out, I think we'll really see an energy momentum and effort that's all happening behind the scenes really kind of hit the mainstream. So it's quite an exciting moment or, you know, point in the journey for open banking at the moment. And as a result of the research, I think the whole team, so it's been led by our um, really brilliant strategy team, and they've been left super excited about the opportunities of diversifying fundraising. And there's a lot of creative experimentation going on out there, how we can raise um, funds and activate fundraising in a really different um, uh, way and looking at all the mechanisms around that. So there's a lot of stuff that's already out there, um, loads of different models. Um, for some examples, uh, there's some using QR codes, for example, uh, to cryptocurrency um, that really have a real clear uh, and full um, traceability of ledgers, which is really important. Uh, and ultimately, you know, there's just too many to, to name um, that's already out there. But what I think is a, a key point, I, th- I think it's really quite overwhelming, you know, certainly from a charity to try and get the heads around all, all these models and what's out there. Um, but we have found that there are some really interesting tools and some I'd like to name um, are things like Make It Donate, uh, Momentum, Give a Penny and Money Hub. They've got some really interesting models. Um, but the key thing with these these models you need to evaluate them against your individual charity. And then you look need to look at a campaign that you can set up um, to support it, to make it really and truly meaningful. Mm, yeah, really interesting, Mel. Um, you know, c- c- coming back to you there, there Anna, on some of those points there, because, you know, you obviously mentioned um, some of the n- new sort of tactics that Calm has been using this year. And, and I know that you've seen kind of an increase, for instance, in, in DIY fundraising and sort of obviously virtual events. And, and tell, give us on the back of sort of what Mel is saying there around some of those trends that we've spotted in our research. You know, how does that map across to your experience, you know, over the last sort of um, six to nine months? Sorry, I didn't think my space bar was working there. Um, <laughs> well, because we, we, I mean, we do a lot less in in individual giving um, than a lot of charities because of, um, you know, what I was saying before. Uh, but certainly, certainly in terms of virtual events, we've, as as I think pretty much everybody, um, had the challenge of trying to switch that um, experience over to to the online. Um, and as I was saying, um, saying to this these guys um, when we caught up the other week, it it is a success, and I think it's. It's really important to talk about the the failures as well as the successes and also not to be afraid of, of the term failure um because so some things we've switched to virtual products so for example we had the lost hours walk in october 2019 where we had a thousand people walk over our memory of people that they'd lost naturally wasn't going to be able to happen this october so we switched it um to a diy product where people could put on their own walks and walk wherever they are in the country in their limited groups of six um again still to remember the people that they've they've lost to suicide we actually saw double the number of people walking um and had a higher um return than we did previous year um part of that i do i'm slightly concerned is down to having literally nothing else to do so people are very keen to do something um so i think next year when hopefully all of our restrictions are gone it'll be really interesting to see how the virtual model um, maps up against the in real life model um, as we plan to roll out both. Then in terms of things that didn't work so well, I think one really interesting example from us, uh, which we talked about um, again with, with these guys last week, was um, we jumped on the bandwagon of the um, London 10K. So there's a British 10K, it used to be called, it's now called the London 10K. It happens every July. It's 10K around the city of London pretty straightforward it's usually one of our biggest events we had about 500 people take part last year which was phenomenal 
Um, and we wanted to be able to give our runners something that felt a little bit, a bit, a little bit like how it had felt the previous year. So one of the things we love doing at the charity is organising cheer points. So really being there for in real life for the runners and standing at the sidelines, cheering them on, giving them hugs when they finish, taking them for a pint, talking to them about the people that they're running in memory of. So really building those strong connections with the charity. So my bright idea, I have to confess, um, was to try and replicate this um, online. Um, so we set up a virtual cheer point and we invited all of the people who were running anyway because um, the L10K switched it to a virtual event, invited all of them to come along and have a warm up with this and then come back for a, for a chat afterwards. And to be honest, hardly anyone turned up. Um, and it was a really interesting lesson to learn. And sometimes you can replicate the real life experience. Um, with, you know, it's never going to be exactly the same, but sometimes you can replicate it and sometimes you just can't. Um, and I think we would have we would have done better to have gone. Well, we actually there's no way we can replicate the experience of 20, 30, 40 people standing at the sides of your running event and shouting your name. So we should have done something else. Um, but I just thought that was a really interesting lesson to learn um, and to see how, how some things just aren't going to translate. Mm, def definitely. Um, and actually, um, there's, there's, there was a question um, submitted here. And, and sorry, everyone, please please do keep submitting your questions. We'll, we'll, get, we'll come to them as we go through this. But there's a question here around individual giving. How, have you kind of seen, uh, has individual giving continued to provide a good source of income or has there been a, a, a drop off? How, you know, do you what's the inertia that you see in that? Is there any kind of any, any kind of data coming out around that for you guys? Um, for us, you know, as I said, it, it's a small area for us, but we had an in, in, initial increase when we ran the campaign to actually ask people to donate. Always helps to ask them. Um, and then it, it, it definitely got quieter over the summer, but it seems to be picking back up again now. And our, our average across the year is actually higher than than last year's. And I've, I've spoken to a, a few other charities of a similar size to us, and they seem to be experiencing something similar, that they've mm -hmm. seen um, obviously a massive decrease um, when we're looking at public fundraising and in events because they can't happen. But actually seeing that being slightly made up for by um, IG, um, which I think is really interesting. Um, and certainly, you know, we've, we've seen in the past with the recession in 2009, it didn't actually affect people's giving as dramatically as we all thought it might and we all worried about. And in reality, some people get, ended up giving more um, proportionally than they would have done prior to the recession. Um, so I think there's something really wonderful um, to take solace in with that, 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 you know, the spirit of your supporters is still to be with you, um, even at times when they perhaps don't have as much themselves. Mm. Mm. Def definitely. Um, uh, Mel, as well, we've just had a question here before I circle back to something. Um, someone wanting you to just list those top tips again. You, you mentioned Money Hub, Make It Donate. And was there one other? Or Yeah. So there was there was four that I mentioned. So it's Make It Donate, Momentum, Give a Penny and Money Hub. Definitely, definitely worth a look. And there's, there lot, lots, more, there's lots more out there, but that's that's the top tips yeah. to share for now. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Fantastic, Mel. And and just so I just wanted to circle back to something there, Mel, because because sort of Anna talked really interestingly there about sort of some wins and losses around kind of the digital experiences. Now, sort of just briefly stepping outside of, of the charity space for a second, you know, you you've had a lot of experience with your brands in the consumer space delivering some 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 really great digital experiences. What what would you say are some really important lessons that uh, that need to be learned when when considering about creating a, a, a digital experience that's not just going to look great, but actually work and deliver ROI and 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 uh, and do what you need it to do? I think that the first thing is is always the obvious one, but I think it's the hardest for um, businesses to to implement is to be customer centric. Always, it's always a challenge to to balance business and customer needs. So I think the the, the key thing is always to look at your, your your customer, who your target audience is, and really resonate with them. Uh, and I think, as Anna was saying, it's really important to look um, at anywhere now. It's looking at the whole holistic journey, especially um, the integration from physical activities that you might do and how they manifest or represent themselves online. So you need to look at that end to end journey. Um, and that, you know, that that journey can be um, over like massive periods 
of time. It might not be a short space of time. For example, in automotive, that period of time might be, you know, four, five, 10 years. You might have lifetime customers from awareness to where they purchase a car to where they own a car, where they become loyal and they repeat purchase. And that, that kind of loyalty loop goes around again. So I think it's really important to have a clear view of what um, the end to end customer journeys are. And it's never just one journey and one person. It's personalization is key. It's everybody wants choices, have different um, priorities. So you really need to know and, and offer up choice uh, to your customers to, to, so they can choose what works best for them. Mm-hmm. And and interestingly, there there is a connection here, isn't there, Anna? Because because um, uh, you 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 mentioned um, partnerships before. Um, Seat is obviously one of them, which is is one of Mel's clients. T- yeah. Tell us a little bit about um, sort of your work in in that space, um, Anna, and, and how that's really kind of um, worked hard for you this year. Um, yeah, so well, Calm for a number of years has worked a lot with brands in order to run campaigns, so access the audience that the brand has in order to message around that usually the support services that Calm can offer, or additionally raising awareness of suicide and trying to, which I think we're, we're starting actually to make some headway in as a as a society, um, trying to make the subject of mental health in society less taboo. Um, but doing it in a very accessible way so that, you know, everyone can can take it on, whereas some terminology can be really exclusive to, to lots of particularly if you've got low literacy, EAL, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and so during this period, we've had a, a few campaigns with with different brands um, trying to. It's been a really interesting balance, actually, of trying to keep things relatively lighthearted because it's been such a, a rough time for, for everybody. And we often do run quite a lighthearted thread through our campaigns, um, not all of them, some of them are, are much more serious. Um, and so in this period, we, well, pr- prior to this, we worked with um, Sayat and ran a campaign, which I always get the term wording of wrong, but it was to do with um, strap on a pair, uh, the pair being ears rather than the other. Um, <laughs> and they put a massive pair of ears on a building, um, which attracted quite a lot of attention. Um, and then in, in this period, we've worked with uh, Trin Gamble on their Head and Shoulders brand and had a short ad campaign with Claudia Winkleman. Um, we've also worked with with Carling, um, doing a caring campaign. Um, so there's been there's been a few pieces of activity through that. But I think that what the key has been during this period is making sure that that comes with support for for the organisation. Not least because when we raise awareness of our helpline, it increases demand on our helpline. Therefore, we usually need to increase the number of seats, even if it's just for a, a short period, in order to be able to answer the calls. Mm-hmm. And and you know this year certainly uh, personally I've seen a lot of a lot of brands really consumer brands really really desperate to form charity partnerships and you know I, I, one would hope for usually for the right reasons but I think often it can be because a brand wants to get on a bandwagon and and wants to want to be seen as doing something good I mean an example is is an ad obviously um, we we produced as DDB which is the John Lewis ad. Uh, which is a huge charity angle that is really authentic and and, and, and is designed to to drive genuine um, good. Uh, how do you make sure that the sort of partnerships that you form are really authentic and are done for the right purposes? What are the kind of measures in place to to make sure that it's right the right fit? You know. Yeah, well, we have a no go list essentially um, as part of our ethical policy. So areas that um, we we can't work with because of the nature of what they do, although that list is very short. Um, what we would do instead is if it's a, a sort of a negative brand out there, for example, then we would look at how our partnership is actually going to be a benefit to their audience rather than to the brand. So, for example, um, with Carling, I think it's a really good example. When we worked with them, it was it was a low um, alcohol content. Um, product that sat alongside the campaign rather than usual alcohol content because there is a link between um, sort of substance abuse and suicide but it's not a direct correlation um, always it's, it can be but it's not a it's not sort of a cut and dry um, alcoholism leads to mental health problems leads to suicide so um, but there's a lot of due diligence that goes on behind and um, I think another thing that's really important for us um, not just friends but with other partners is actually on the work that they do internally with their staff and how they support them and making sure that we have opportunity to talk to the staff about the services that Calm offers and the ways that Calm can actually support them as well. 
um, because it, obviously it would be um, irresponsible to work with any brands that or any companies that aren't also looking after their own. Um, but there's often quite heated <laughs> debates about about partners, and really a, a lot of work goes into like a couple of years work went into um, working with Carling, for example, um, it goes into understanding how we can best position it so it's in a positive way for the for the charity more importantly for the people that we're trying to reach Um, just on because you were just talking you were just saying about how a lot of um companies seem to be a little bit bandwagon jumping a i'm not I think we can actually take advantage of that um, and so that they jump on the right bandwagons and that they jump in the right way and the right check in their pocket um, but my favorite, I, there's one I saw a couple of days ago, it's my absolute favorite at the moment, is the Papa John's advert. I don't know if you've seen it, but they've essentially, their advert is based around the fact that they donated their Christmas advert budget to Crisis and Trussell Trust. And I thought that was absolutely brilliantly done. Um, if only I liked Papa John's pizza, I would buy some. Um, but I just thought it was a, a really neat idea. And there's one that I wish I'd thought of. I wish I'd gone to a brand and asked them for their Christmas ad budget. But there you go. <laughs> really interesting yeah and and actually as well you know um not just i guess consumer brands to charities but i think there's been a lot of support from from our industry from the marketing industry with 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 charities this year as well i mean as as a group as as with uh, for, for those that might not know so we're part of the dvb group in turn part of the omnicom group and actually one of the ways that the great ormond street hospital connection came around is is is, is john wren um um uh, connected with with great ormond street hospital um sort of signed off for a lot of of um, not quite pro bono work, but for basically next to nothing work to, to support Great Ormond Street Hospital through. So doing the their Christmas ad and the research we've been doing, um, which it, it's it's not about the money. It's not about making, it's about doing the right thing. And, and I think certainly from the creative and technical industries, there definitely needs to be much more willingness to to engage with with businesses pro bono. I mean, I know that um, Anna, you mentioned some some data work you've been doing as well uh with 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 a partner and i just think i think it's about doing the right thing really um you know um there's there's a question here so, um anna um uh, and uh it's it's here so there's been a lot of talk around mental health this year because of lockdowns job losses etc and, and i'm sure there's just going to be more to come as as the real kind of long-term impacts of of this year begin to to take effect um so the question is is do you think um you know you've changed or will you will you need to change the way you talk about mental health as a, as, as a charity um will supporters engage with it more or in a different way what are your thoughts on on that that's a really interesting question that is, that is an interesting question, and it, it's not something I've actually um, thought about yet. But I think that the, if you're not familiar with um, Calm's brand and, and who we are, we've always sat slightly um, outside of the more traditional circles. So um, Samaritans in Mind are probably the two biggest um, mental health charities in the UK, and they cover a huge um, proportion of the population and a huge proportion of people who are struggling. So Calm has always deliberately sat slightly outside of that because there's a group of individuals, of people, quite a large group, unfortunately, for whom they just don't work. The the language is, doesn't resonate with them. They don't know what's meant by words like depression. They don't feel like they can just phone up and start talking to a good Samaritan, in inverted commas. Um, so Calm has always sat in a slightly different space. We actually don't really, I mean, I've said mental health a few times here, just because it's a really handy shorthand, but we don't actually really talk about mental health um, when we're running campaigns. We don't even really talk about well-being. Um, a lot of the times in the past, we've, we've used much more common vernacular. Um, for example, one of our biggest um, pieces of, mer- of um, campaigning materials that we sent out used to talk about feeling shit. Um, so just really in, and not in a oh look at us we're being shocking by saying a rude word kind of way but just trying to express the the sentiment in a way that's really accessible to people um, and so originally Calm was very much targeted at um, men in, in sort of the middle age category because they're the most likely to take their own life so I don't I don't think we, we will change wildly in how we and how we approach mental health because I think we've, we've always tried to sit on the sidelines slightly in order to reach those people who don't go to the GP um, and talk about the mental health who don't access any other kind of services because actually they're the people who end up taking their own life are the ones that aren't getting support elsewhere so we always try and come in at a slightly different angle if that makes sense 
Absolutely. Sorry, you just stopped talking as a sneeze was coming up. <laughs> I was like, please just keep talking for the uh, I'll keep wishing while you're yeah, sneezing. It's fine. It's, it, it's, it's gone. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I think there's, there's, there's something I've picked up on there, uh, both, both when we were talking about the brand partnerships, but also there about how you're, how you're communicating around the kind of, I, I kind of interpret that in some ways as, because uh, you mentioned it, audiences, you know, and, and all the different types of audiences. And, 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 and Mel, again, without sort of giving away too much of the secret sauce, I know that a part of the research that we did um, for Gosh was around the kind of three typologies, sort of the three um, sort of audience um, type type types when it came to sort of open banking as as new potential uh, um, audiences and how to obviously uh, sort of engage each of them very differently. Yeah. Could you give us kind of a bit of a top line on that again uh without yeah. without giving too much away i, th- I think that the important thing is is um like anna was saying you have to resonate uh and and as we sort of said before well, there isn't like one silver bu- bullet that works so you have to understand who your audience is and resonate with them um uh, from different levels and i think what it kind of top line what we were looking at is is um slightly different demographics or uh, uh looking at people who have a higher propensity um, to do, donate on a regular basis um, versus then people that might be doing it on a more kind of ad hoc basis. And what, um, like we said, I think that one of the key aspects as well is looking at what the triggers and behaviours are uh, that we can kind of help nudge to encourage these different people to donate. Um, so it, it's really important to, uh, again, come back to understanding the three typologies that we pulled out um i think are are a good overview for open banking and something that we you know we can go into a bit more detail with um with with charities if we get the opportunity would be wonderful Mm, mm, absolutely so we're sort of reaching the the last 20 minutes i believe or not of the call already so i just wanted to now sort of pivot a little bit and and uh look look really towards the future um you know Anna coming back to you I think you know I know you were talking a lot about sort of removing the barriers in order to innovate and um you know you've already mentioned about sort of changing the way you, you were working to a very much sort of top-down approach and, and taking that ownership as as, a, as as part of the SLT but t- t- obviously planning mode now 2021 is around the corner Give us a bit of a, a, a flavour as to kind of where your focus is right now, kind of what the opportunities and challenges that you see going uh, through 2021. And, and yeah, what's what, what I guess what's keeping you up at night? <laughs> I think that, I mean, the biggest challenge is the, the continuing uncertainty around real life events, because previously my strategy, our strategy very much focused on events. Um, and that was going to be a big new win was going to be real life events, um, which obviously can't really work. We don't know when they'll be able to happen. Um, I think what we're doing now that we've got ourselves into a stable position where um, where our income is is solid and, and we're not terrified about what's happening tomorrow. I mean, those days definitely existed. There was a day when we had about £12 come in for the day. Um, which was horrendously low um, for us. And that was absolutely a terrifying moment. Um, but what I want to do in this coming year is really go back to um, go back to what we've always prided ourselves on, which is supporter care. So making sure that we are really, truly looking after those supporters. Um, it's always been a big emphasis of ours because, of, as I said before, the nature of what we do and the fact that uh, I, so there's hammering in the background. I apologise if it disturbs you. Um, there's a high proportion of our supporters who are raising in memory of somebody. So looking after them, making sure that they can be signposted to appropriate resources to support them has always been incredibly important. So in this new year, I want to really make sure that we can focus on that and that we can provide even more support for those people. Um, who are bereaved by suicide, not not least because it's a nice thing to do, um, but also people who um, who are bereaved by suicide are more likely to take their own life in future. And then additionally, from Calm's point of view, they raise more for us. Um, So there's very much a sort of being kind as being smart kind of approach there. Um, Then additionally, something that we really need to get better at is conversion. So we've we've brought in supporters. Um, They've given us a tenner. They've given us... Um, 20 quid they've taken part in a lost hours walk for us but usually we do nothing with them with that and the journey very much cuts off about a week after the activity so conversion is going to be a really big project for us and understanding who the people are why they came to us in the first place and what they're most likely to do next um is probably our biggest challenge so rather than just constantly reaching out to new audiences thinking about how we can better engage the ones we already have 
really interesting yeah. and Mel, I know that you're obviously involved in a lot of the planning for, for your clients, et cetera, but, but I, I, you know, obviously you've been doing this a long time and, and steered a lot of brands through a lot of other crises as well. I mean, any, any thoughts on some of the things Anna was saying there, you know, any, any, anything you'd, you'd add to any charities looking to, to next year as, as to what they should be doing or could be doing? Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, there's a few things to point out. We were talking about um, partnerships before. And I think any charity, um, you might already have a partnership set up, but I think you should absolutely look at um, expanding them, those. There's no reason why you have to have exclusive um, charity partnerships. So as we said, I think there's a massive um, uplift in opportunities to partner with businesses and there's a big appetite there for that. Um, and I think what what is really interesting, what we've um, seen from, from open banking specifically, one of the key benefits is help unlock more money for charities. And there's a lot of inefficiencies of donation payments, the fees that are involved, the, the admin that's involved, um, setting up payments currently. So it's really pertinent um, as more and more donors are really keen to see the transparency of how much money really hits the cause is really important versus how much is going into fees or admin for example so this transparency is is really important um to donors and and to support um really effective fundraising and what we found um really interesting um stat is that um in terms of uh, a top quality that is sought from charities when donating how the organization will actually use the donation is really important and it's become you know 60 percent of charity givers have cited this as the most important factor so that's a really, really key takeaway. Um, and 52% say so they need evidence of an organization having impact. Um, so the term like overhead aversion comes into play where people want to see where the money's going and make sure it's going straight uh, at the heart of the charity. So I think this this opportunity for, for partnerships is, um, is a really key one. Um, I think also um, it's an opportunity, you know, it's at the end of the year, it's always a traditional time to take stock. I think it's a great opportunity for charities to reevaluate the strategy and take time to reflect um, you know, what's important from a business point of view, what's important from your customers um, and your donors and what, what is and isn't, isn't working. I think Anna's made a really important point before. You mustn't be afraid to experiment. You've got to try things out. And I think it's really important um, not to be worried about failing. I think that's a really, really key uh, tip, I would say. Um, and I think um, it's, it, you've got to evaluate what, what has worked both on and offline, because hopefully when this is all over next year, you're going to be in a position again to shift back to more physical activities. So how can you make the two work together? How does the online uh, and virtual activities complement and support um, the physical activities and vice, vice versa? Um, so I think that, that that's that's kind of really interesting. I think um, top tip would be to evaluate all the new technology that's out there. And um, there's loads of stuff, as I mentioned, that's 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 out there. And I think there's an opportunity for people to look at um, how this could potentially plug some gaps that, that COVID has given um, and look at really how you could seize the opportunity to work closely with some of those that are already investing in building the infrastructure for open banking. Um, like I said, I think charities should be curious and open to exploring and diversifying their, their, their ways and looking to align that with their target audience. I think as a result, um, what's interesting, you, you may want to look at how you carve out your own resource internally. I know Anna mentioned about establishing a digital team. So it might be that, um, you know, where you need to, to adapt to going forward may, may mean sort of changes internally in terms of the skill sets or gaps that you might need to fill in skill sets, either, you know, from an internal resource point of view or outsourcing support. Um, but my top, top tip, I would say, I reckon, is concentrating on content and storytelling that donors really need to um, see the impact of their contributions and you need to maintain a conversation over the long term and sustain those relationships so you want to generate uh, advocates and they'll encourage new donors too so i think as well as um looking at um really uh, getting rid of it you know getting efficiencies um of donations and making sure they go uh, to the point where we need them um, you need to look at uh, reducing fees streamlining and administration removing these payment frictions all these things that open banking can do um, there's a big opportunity there and we, we just say don't wait act now because you'll you'll be playing catch up otherwise forever 
Wow. Yeah. Wow. Gosh, there's a lot of top, top tips there. Thanks, Mel. Um, so the last sort of five to 10 minutes um, is for Q&A. So, so please, uh, there's been a lot discussed so far. So please um, submit any questions uh, to me for the last sort of five to 10 minutes. Take the most of Mel, Mel and Anna's time. We've got one question here as you kind of ended on open banking there, Mel. Um, speaking as a complete newbie to open banking, sorry, I'm talking in the <laughs> the person here. Um, where where should a charity fresh to its start? What do we need to think about or look for to know if it's for us? Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a great question, and I think there's there's um, kind of two two areas to kind of to to look at. I think um, the first is there's some tools that are already out there that are ready, you know, that are ready to go. Uh, there's a lot there's a lot out there, um, but I think I mentioned before it's quite overwhelming. So I think it's almost like you need to do an assessment or an evaluation of what's out there and try and identify those tools that might be might be relevant to you. And there's also um, as the ones that I kind of uh, previously named name check before I think there are opportunities to sort of build a wrapper around some of the tools that are out there and look at how you can make them meaningful for your charity so looking at how um, you can add a campaign to it and really evaluate and work um, you know exploring and identifying what that opportunity is um, I have to be honest I would say it's not straightforward it's not just something like you can just sort of Get a, get a list of here we go off you go it, it's set there I think like I said it's quite an overwhelming landscape at the minute so um you know certainly from from a from a, a tribal point of view what we've what we've done with gosh is offer this consultancy to try and make sense of it and I think that's that's something that we we'd love to do for more charities either take them through uh, the research that we've done get your teams up to speed with what the opportunities could be for open banking and look at how you know you can explore some of the specific tools that are out there for sure. Mm, definitely and i think just just to add to that i think um you know what one of the uh one of the things that for me is uh in the conversations with gosh was was sometimes turning to 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 the, the your own bank you know because they're they're the end users and the experts so you know whoever you're you're banking with you know they will have um you know your relationship manager will know people on the back end side of the business um for instance we're, we're we're currently talking to barclays aren't we uh mel and and you know these are the guys that are really at the the, the, the spear spear end of, of 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 open banking and forming those sorts of partnerships um you say to find the technology that you can wrap something around as mel said is 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 is, is, is a really interesting conversation to have um but yeah no so i mean that's that's all really interesting and and anna i suppose you know um you know as far as oh yeah i'm not sure if i don't think open bank is necessarily something that you've looked into per se um you know as, speaking as a charity is is it something that presents a, an opportunity for, for you guys to to do the research into or or how do you feel about it having spoken to us a few times about it uh, I, I feel like it's something I'm going to hand over to one of my colleagues who knows far more about these things than I do. Um, we're, we're very fortunate we have a head of digital um, who started a little under a year ago at, at Calm and she, alongside our brilliant accountant, is probably the best place to start. I literally was putting it on my to-do list as you were talking. <laughs> um, so, so no progress yet. Uh, maybe I'll back in a year and <laughs> we'll see how we're getting on. Yeah, I, mean, I, think, I, think, I think the question. Sorry, Mel, you go. Sorry, Jamie. I was just, I was just going to say. I think Anna, for you, one of the the interesting areas to explore would be. I know you mentioned kind of running activities being quite a a, a crucial element traditionally to how you how you've raised money. Um, you know, some of the interesting tools that are being set up are connecting to things like. Um, Fitbits uh, and Apple Watches, and how through that that third party technology, the activities um, that people can do uh, can incrementally be a way to donate at the same time. And I think looking at not necessarily, um, you know, you would have a physical event that's on a specific day, but actually, um, you know, the future potentially could be accruing um, kind of targets over time. It might be someone has a, a target to do X amount of steps in a month or so many um, Ks that they want to run a week or in, in a year so it's kind of a, an incremental way to generate um uh, revenue or fundraise mm. over a long period of time rather than a, a, an individual event so mm. some really cool tech out there that, that will enable you to kind of tap into ways that people are kind of on a day-to-day basis doing activities that then could translate into cool ways to to generate um revenue for for their chosen charities mm. Mm. 
And I think for me, I think a common thread um, throughout this whole year, uh, talking to brands in pretty much most of the sectors out there, um, it was one of the first budgets to get slashed back in March, April time. And that's the market research budget, you know, and I think I think it's super important to be investing in that market research, um, no matter whether you're, you know, a charity or if you're selling cars or if you're, you're selling anything else, you know, I think do the market research whilst, you know, the the uh, the, the the market is, is, is in this sort of space of flux, understand kind of how your audiences have changed, understand, um, you know, where the trends are. Um, because it, it, it's worth every penny that research and and um, you know as as Mel said, uh, you know tribal have spent quite a bit of time in that space. Um, so for any of the the charities listening who'd, who'd be keen to find out more about that research, obviously do reach out to myself after after this webinar and, and we can certainly set up sort of one on one sessions with myself and Mel uh, to, uh, to 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 go through that with you guys. Um, you know, we're, we're here to help, you know, we're, we're, we're kind of a leader in the tech and creative industries and, and it's our job really to support, um, you know, businesses um, like yourselves. So, so do get in touch if any of that's sort of interest. So we haven't had any more questions submitted. Um, so, um, so it's sort of really down to, to wrapping up now, I suppose. Um, we, I think you guys have really summarized things really well, I guess, just as some closing thoughts, um, Anything that you might not have mentioned or anything you'd like to reiterate as just some closing takeaways if you if anyone was to take away uh you know one or two key things today um Anna, what what would they be for you um I'm glad you asked because I was something to pick up on from what Melissa was saying around um the skills within the team the, the resource that you've got, which is something I've been thinking about you know as the as the landscape is changing potentially um for the longer term looking at what the skills are that your team has and where those gaps are um, and not being afraid of, of upskilling them because some of them are going to be feeling very nervous if they're in challenge events for example they'll be very, feeling very nervous about their their role and whether they're likely to continue the organization so if there are opportunities particularly um, you know, even attending things like this um, in, in particular um, not necessarily like 300 pound courses um, but being able to, to start to get a, a flavor of, um, of other skills or other opportunities like open banking um, I would I would strongly encourage you um, if you are a team leader to, to do that with your team because uh, it's a great opportunity for them to learn also means you can um, you know, hone, hone the skills within the team into areas um, that you're interested in and also d devolving that so it doesn't have to all be up to, to you to find things out but actually can you can challenge one of your team to, to look into a new area or to understand major donor giving for example if it's not something that the, the organisation's embarked on before. Mm. Great and, and, and Mel uh, anything to add there as a final takeaway or anything you'd like to reiterate? I just think the the that kind of characteristic of being curious and open to change and and not being afraid to change it's you know it's it's uh, uh, it's always important to adapt and the the landscape has so fundamentally changed this year I think it's been quite hard for businesses to to get their heads around it and really look at how uh, they can evolve and how they can respond to it and I just think it's really important not be not to be afraid to fail and to be curious and explore there's a lot of great tech out there that will really um sort of change the way that fundraising can be uh, delivered going forward so be curious find out about it and look at how that can relate and align to, to your charity and really resonate with your your donors um it, 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 there's a lot out there so find out about it and really make it work for your charity Mm. And of course, having a great guide in the way of tribal worldwide would help for sure. Oh, <laughs> Always a salesman. Sorry. Yeah. No. Excellent that, plug at the end. Uh, <laughs> there we are. Um, no, look, I think that's all really interesting. We're, we're pretty much at time and I can just imagine how busy our, our audience and yourselves are. So um, I just wanted to, to, I guess, wrap up in saying that, um, you know, yeah, the offer is there for, for anyone on the call today to reach out. I'm more than happy to have further chats one on one and pick up on anything we've spoken about today um, and also keep an eye out um, moving into 2021. 
for our future webinar events. Um, you, you know, TBC, as far as kind of content, et cetera, is concerned, we're currently working frantically with our marketing team to to pull that together, but it'll be a fresh um, webinar series to, to go into the new year with. So keep an eye out in your inbox for them. Thank you very much, Anna, for your time. Um, you've worked really hard to, to pull some this content together for us and it's really interesting. I wish you absolutely all the best in your charity for next year. I'm sure you're going to make it a success. And, and Mel, thank you very much for taking some time away from, from, from your clients and, 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 and your desk to, to, to join us. Some really interesting insights. Um, and and I'll, I'll leave it there. And um, yeah, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, keep safe, keep well and, and have fantastic Christmases if we don't talk to you beforehand. Take care then. Bye.